found your videos online and I was really inspired by it. I feel like you're speaking to me. But I think it opened something up. stumble out of the garage and into the yard where you fall. You lie on the ground, hole in your chest, another in your lung. You wonder how your family will survive this. You realize that you will not survive this. You can't speak, and no one speaks to you. If I may um, start with Travis, um, maybe we can discuss the film a little bit by you telling us a little bit the outline of it. Um, Travis Matthews, you might know, has had a film at the Panorama, it's called Interior Leather Bar, that he co-directed with James Franco and has had a series of sort of like investigations into uh, gay male sexuality and sensuality with, their, uh, with his I In Their Room series and with a film called I Want Your Love. And um, as we already discussed in the Q&A, this film stylistically, but also maybe politically, is a departure from that into a different direction. Maybe you can just give us a bit of an outline of the film and also tell us a little bit about maybe um, the politics of what you talk about in the film. Sure. Um, I think briefly, in sort of a short synopsis, log line -y kind of description of the film first, it's about a man returning home to rural Texas uh, to find closure with uh, his estranged mother. And in the process, he learns uh, the secret. He learns that this horrible man from his past is still alive. And from there, it becomes his journey toward finding a type of closure around that and also confronting this man and then a number of other things kind of unravel and present themselves. Um, but the, the kind of genesis of this film came about where I was in, I was in Central Texas in 2015, in the summer of t 2015, and I was driving around in this van that's almost like a supporting character in the film, and um, I was listening to talk radio, and um, I'm from rural Ohio, so it's not, it's not like a new, I'm not like a city boy who's like, who are these country people? You know, it felt very familiar to me, but it also felt really charged by um, what were previously, I think, um, almost universally seen as far-right conservative fringe voices that now seem to be ascending with power and they seem to be getting drunk on their power and they seemed to not be, um, there being fewer and fewer consequences for crazy things they were saying and doing. And there was an energy in the air that felt very, like an anxious energy in the air, and it felt very palpable. And um, I was wanting to do something that felt urgent, that dealt with the politics of that, and dealt with essentially how I see it as a patriarchy on the run, basically, where the straight, white, aging, um, conservative men of America and um, around the world mostly um, see that the demographics aren't in their favor for the future generations. And as they see that, there's, in my mind, I, I, it's almost to me like they've made this Faustian deal where in order to maintain power, um, they've agreed to do the most immoral, perverse, disgusting, um, just heinous things to maintain their power at any cost. And so, so I wanted to channel all of that um, with one other thing that I was experiencing while I was there. So uh, as a gay man, you know, I, I turned on all the gay hookup apps while I was in Central Texas, and there's a certain amount of uh, closeted 
sort of on the DL uh, thing that I was anticipating to find. But what was fascinating to me and also fascinating how I felt it was intersecting with these larger politics I'm talking about was seeing the number of men who not even disembodied torso pictures, but had black boxes, just black boxes that said discreet. And there were a lot of them. And it, it was like this black hole in my filmmaker brain. I mean, and again, like none of this is in the film in terms of, of the apps and, and all of that. None of that's in the film. But it was an entry point for me just in terms of being fascinated by such a stark and dark image that was everything and nothing. And I was curious about how these increasingly intense politics that are really rigid politics around like basically fear of losing power and how I define that even further, fear of being emasculated. How, how those politics were continuing to inform out gay men and closeted gay men in, in America, but specifically in Central Texas when I was there. And so I wanted to take, take, take what I was experiencing kind of anecdotally with what I was hearing on the news and on the talk radio and the energy in the air, and I wanted to harness that and then kind of channel it through this character of Alex, who is our, 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 our guy that we follow throughout the course of the film. And as you follow him, um, you're, you're kind of dropped inside his head. So it's, it's its own journey, and I'm sure we'll talk more about it, but that's kind of the, the beginnings of the film. I think for, for, thank you very much for that answer. And I think for um, what you talked about, you found quite stunning visual solutions. And I have a clip from the film that I wanted to show that sums up a lot of what you said, but so you get a better impression. And I think it's a very uh, um, sort of like impressive scene taking into account what you just talked about. Um, in, in this clip, I think the, the idea of an oppression or of a closet is, is more than um, sort of like obvious um, in this 
first of all, in this in this sex club or in the sex shop that it is, and the, in the fact that um, uh, the porn that is being watched is a straight porn, and that your character also, you see him here, um, always has an expression of sort of fear or sort of um, uh, sadness, even although you know we're talking about a very joyful thing of like two people coming together and sort of like having sex. Maybe you can tell us a little bit. I'm actually um, interested in, in knowing if these locations were all sort of like the authentic locations there. If this is sort of like if this this closet culture that you already described with the apps, um, if that is is the reality there and, and wh what you make of it in a sense for queer people. I d Bring me back to what you asked if I go tangential because I, I wanted to share something. So there was a there was another trip. So that is that really is what we kind of call a porn barn. I mean, not in America, you don't call it a porn barn, but like me and my team call it a porn barn because we were fascinated by this place we found that, that really is what you saw. That is the exterior, that is the interior, um, and there wasn't a lot of like dressing of the place. Um, but there was a different there was a different triple X place that I actually wanted to shoot at originally that, w that was its own inspiration for this film. It was a place it was a place that I actually went to to get lube myself. And while I was there, I, w I went into this place where it was off of the freeway, and there's freeways in Texas, and the freeways around Austin, they're just like everywhere, 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 which is also um, kind of a, a common theme and, and, and discreet. But this, this porn place, the one that's not here, but the one that inspired me, was off the freeway, off what they call a frontage road. And um, you had to go through the small woods, and then there was this, large cement parking lot, just a square cement parking lot that was crumbling around the edges and sort of falling into the woods around it. And in the middle was a three-story concrete building with no windows. <laughs> and I was fascinated by it. Like, I, it just visually, I was fascinated by it. And so I went there, and it was clear to me that this was a porn place that had not been renovated since it was, since it exist, since it was born in the, like, 70s, probably. The signs were that old, the wood paneling was there, and all of this. And they had these booths, like the one that you see in there. They had all of these different, um, they had two floors of private booths. And the way that it worked, I understood very quickly. Um, and, you know, I explored partly as a gay man and partly, like, as an anthropological kind of, like, what is going on here kind of thing. Um, you go into these booths, and as soon as you put a coin in, the porn comes on, and, um, and, and, and then a light goes on outside your door that says it's occupied. But all of these guys leave their doors open a little bit, so people know they're in there, and they can come in and join them. And what I found from my personal experience being there were almost everyone there was closeted, and almost all of them were um, Latino, and a lot of them didn't speak English, and a lot of them like this was their sort of safest outlet to express their sexuality. Um, so to I think answer your question, um, yes, I feel like this was really like alive and, and real in uh, Central Texas. Um, maybe we can, we can go to you, Yancy, and um, your, your film is, is, is different, of course, in many ways. It's a documentary. It's your a feature debut, um, it's, I would say, the similarity in style or in, 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 in narrative or narration is also that um, Travis does not try to make sense in a sense that um, to deliver answers, to um, give people easy solutions cinematically, logically, politically. Um, but your film, first of all, goes back. It uh, maybe, I don't want to tell the film, maybe you can also tell what it's about, like as Travis did, sure. and we're in Long Island, New York now, and maybe you can walk us a little bit through the film and also the times that, well, happened. Sure. It's, um, so you, you'll do the trailer first, or do you want me to talk first? Um, should I uh, show the trailer? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. stumble out of the garage and into the yard where you fall. You lie on the ground 
hole in your chest, another in your lung. You wonder how your family will survive this. You realize that you will not survive this. You can't speak and no one speaks to you. You do not know that we are silent in our grief, even with one another. You do not know your killer will say he had to shoot you. You do not know your killer will make you out to be a monster. You do not realize that there will be no trial. You don't know that 23 white people will decide no crime has even been committed. William turned and was shot. That was the beginning. So, um, sort of to dovetail off of your point, um, the, the demographic that is in its Faustian um, last you know, gasp now um, was probably at its most powerful moment um, um, in you know, sort of American governance and in American culture um, in 1992 when my brother was killed. Um, so it was very, very easy at that time to, um, to simply say I, I was scared of this black man who was angry at me for, you know, um, a very mundane reason and therefore I felt it was necessary to defend myself with deadly force, right? Um, and of course at that time, um, a grand jury was impaneled by the local district attorney and in, in New York, um, which you know does not exist in most of Europe um, and exists differently in in, in states around uh, America, um, you have to have a, a body of 23 people decide that what you've done may or may not be a crime. It's, it's not beyond reasonable doubt to moral certainty. It's the standard is so low you could step over it getting out of bed in the morning, um, and. At that time, a group of people decided that um, the young white man who killed my brother um, was justified in doing so, had not committed a crime, and therefore did not stand trial and, and never um, uh, was punished in any way for the crime that he committed. He has no criminal record. Um, he disappeared into the fabric of, um, of Long Island and the suburbs where the, where the crime took place. Um, and so the film, Strong Island, really does two things. Um, it, it lays out for the audience how very simple and how easy it is to take a black life in America. And very little about that has changed, um, with the exception of the you know, rise of Black Life, Lives Matter and you know, movements of resistance that have been born of younger generations. And, um, social media and cell phone cameras and, and all of the things that did not exist when my brother was killed and um, surveillance, you know, surveillance footage even. Um, so it, it sort of maps out how easy it was to do that then. Um, and you know, when you get to, oh, because he was black, then you know, the film has to and, and did go deeper into the questioning of um, the aftermath of my brother's death, which, um, and one of the things that's, that strikes me so much about what our films have in common is the silence. Um, because it plunged, um, you know, di all of us into different types of silences. Um, and, you know, some of those silences were um, more implosive and immediately fatal, as in my father. Uh, in my father's case, and others, um, you know, were sort of a, you know, life-changing um, events in, 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 you know, in the case of my sister and myself, because ironically, um, the, 
When my brother had been shot, it was a week before spring break, and I had been working with a, an on-campus counselor um, to plan how I would come out to my family over that spring break. Um, and so when that happened, among the things that I did not do when I got home was to have that conversation with my family. Um, I never got to have that conversation with William, um, even though my sister, um, in her infinite wisdom, uh, saw my How to Come Out to Your Parents in 10 Easy Steps um, <laughs> book on the coffee table and sort of like, you know, just sort of took it and was like, Yancey did not mean to leave this here, so I'm just going to put it in my room and, and, and you know, give it back when the time seems appropriate. Um, but, you know, Strong Island really does, you know, map this arc of decline. Um, and from the inside of the home, literally from the inside of the home, um, and it creates a sort of, you know, intimate immersion into what the experience was like for all of us. Um, and one of the things that I think we, you know, we can talk about uh, as well is is the gendering. Um, that's so that's so obvious in the film, and so much a part of suburban middle class life and aspiration um, that is, you know, visible in the pictures that I bring into the frame. Right, sort of like, oh look, William is comfortable in his short sleeve shirts, and Yancey and Lauren are dying in patent leather shoes um, in Washington D.C. when it's almost 100 degrees. So um, there's a lot of there's a lot of intricate family dynamics, um, uh, and the subtext of of gendering and sexual orientation, um, and the knowledge or or the hidden knowledge of of who um, each of us were to each other um, is very much a one of the you know, strongest themes in the film. Um, could you talk a little bit more about, about the gendering? Um, because it's, when we see you, um, uh, Yancy is, is talking into the camera um, in the film, and then there's, uh, you work a lot with, I want to say archive footage, but it's actually family album um, images held into the camera as a stylistic device of, of memory, maybe of, um, of uh, remembrance and we see a very different Yancey Ford there, and like um, I, I, I think I just didn't understand that where the gendering comes from, and that you just talked about was that like an internal um, family gendering, or was that like a societal, like a, a gendering of that, or uh, like an own gendering? Sure, it it what? No, sure. sure, to hold the mic closer. I have a very bad habit of holding mics too far away. Um, the the gendering of my sister and I um, was simply the way that my mother had been raised, um, you know, as a young girl in the South, um, and her understanding of what was appropriate for, you know, little girls to wear, and what was appropriate for, you know, boys to wear. And so, you know, it, it, it did not occur to her um, that she was engaged in an act of gendering, except when, you know, I would throw a fit about not wanting to wear certain clothes, or my sister would throw a fit about not wanting to wear certain clothes. It was more cultural um, than it was, um, you know, suppressive or, or, or deliberately confining. Um, but the the effect that it had um, on 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 me in particular was um, to um, to establish really firmly what was okay for. Um, for me and my sister to wear, and what was not okay for me and my sister to wear, and what the consequences of um, when we got to a certain age um, of, of, of a simple, of a physical refusal to put the clothes on, um, which is, you know, how it sort of escalated, um, you know, in um, the years that I grew more and more outspoken about not wanting to wear certain things. Um, so, you know, my, my parents were doing what they were taught. My parents were dressing us, um, you know, and my mother especially was dressed, you know, she dressed us as she um, was raised to, you know, understand was appropriate. But, you know, underneath all of that, appropriateness was a very hard and fast um, reinforcement of heterosexual identity. Um, and, and, and that's where, well, you know, when I talk about gendering, um, that's where I think that the crux of the issue was for me, is that it, it felt, literally, the, felt, the clothes felt like an expectation of a certain identity 
um, and in rejecting those clothes um, and therefore rejecting that identity, um, that was the first kind of fissure um, in my relationship um, with my parents and their expectations of who I would be um, in my life. Um, I found it interesting that you included your coming out in the film. There is a short moment of that, mm. um, but it doesn't take up a lot of space. The narrative is about that, of, of your family, of the friends, of the silence, of the grief, uh, of the injustice. And um, I wonder if you ever considered not including it into the narrative of that, because as you do, you sort of like put a little um, dot in the narrative that goes back with every, as I said, picture that we look at because we go again back to the past. And it could be there's a thread or a fabric of sexuality, gender identity in it as well that yeah. doesn't really connect to what's happening in a sense, in a very positive sense, but it's still there, yeah. I think. And yeah, I wonder if that was your intention or if you didn't want to say more about, talk more about your coming out in the film. Well, I, I, f I was really adamant that my character um, and the, the, the importance of the phone call not be isolated to simply having, um, you know, a sort of a buddy, <coughs> a buddy to buddy moment with my brother. Um, it, you know, the, the fact that I was out, um, you know, so far away from home and I had not come out to my brother yet and we had this conversation that made me feel closer to him in a way that made him feel less like a stranger and made me feel less like a stranger to him, uh, you know, is, is integral to why that phone call is important and why that phone call, you know, even to this day, you know, withholds such, um, such really dense and deep um, contradiction. Because it was this moment of, like, genuine connection and, and genuine masculine connection with my brother, right? And it also was a moment where I, um, where I still wonder if I had said anything, would it have made a difference? Um, and I could not leave out that my sexual orientation was behind why that phone call was so important to me, and that my emerging um, identity as, as transgender and you know as a butch dyke. Um, when I was in college, I, I, you know, it's, it's part and parcel. It, the, the two of them are so conjoined um, because it's, it's not like, you know, the older brother calling his younger sister. It felt like, you know, William calling the person who I felt I was. Um, and even though I hadn't shared that with him, it was a, it was a definite masculine moment. Um, and so, th so that, um, that moment in the film, though it's brief, um, was absolutely necessary. Um, and, you know, we had to make so many choices. There's so much material, there's so much story. Um, but that was one that, that I wasn't willing to really give up because, you know, it's, it's part of why my character um, exists and evolves and changes visually over the course of the, of the, of the archival photos and the family photos and also on screen. Um, I look very, I mean, I look older. Um, um, you know, from the beginning of the film to the, you know, to the end of the film. It's fine. Um, so, you know, I, I change both um, on screen as a character in, in, Str in Strong Island, visually. Um, uh, and I also change in the family archive. Um, so it, it, it was really important that that masculine moment and that, and that, that cross um, gender moment between the two of us be in the film because that's because that's why it is both so important and so um, heartbreaking in a way because it's it, it holds both the connection and the you know the possibility that severing that connection could have led to a different outcome so. uh, thank you for that answer and also for, for the talk of that. Um, Travis, maybe talking about narrations and narratives, um, in, in your film it is an open narrative as I said um, before. It works a lot with visuals, also with sound, but there is also a clear narrative thread and that is that of um, the history of your main protagonist and um, that of 
I would say the monster in quotation marks and the, the abuser th who is still alive and the discovery that he is and maybe you can talk a little bit about how you constructed this very loose and very um, open and, and quite smart I find narration around that that white old man that did so much harm well I I thought it, 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 an interesting thing about this film if anybody's ever seen anything else I've done and in my previous work, it's been so much about like not not being shy to show what is there and to be very sort of upfront with like showing things, whether it's sex or, or something that is just very, very, very intimate in some ways, whether it's emotional or, or sexual. And with this, I mean, not to be too like clever with the title of it being discreet, but I wanted um, I wanted to the way that we th the way that we integrated the film i wanted there to be a lot of withholding of what we show in order to let people go there with their own imaginations which i think for this particular film is much more en engrossing and maybe terrifying than if i were to actually show the literal old man right there and i think um because the movie does go through um alex's point of view um you know, uh, our, our memories, especially if they're filled with moments of trauma, our, our memories that are incomplete and are of partial images and are of emotion and are not always so literal. And um, and I wanted, and I also liked the idea of him representing sort of um, not just this one person, but this idea of, of, of what I was discussing earlier. And... Um, and I also just think it's it's a much scarier image to not see any of his features, but just this dark figure that's approaching you almost as if, I mean, it, 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 to me, it's like a, you're, you're in the midst of a nightmare, like a literal nightmare. Um, yeah. There's also, um, you have three male characters. We have the young boy here that he finds at a supermarket more or less and we don't know if there's anything like what he wants from him at first you leave that open as well and he brings him to um, the perpetrator to the house um, and there's also a, a, um, a scene of violence at the kitchen table and the idea of generations and of a tradition of violence or of you know generations sort of like um, giving furthering violence or experiences of violence is, is quite you know um, is, is imminent in the in the storyline maybe I was wondering if you could could talk about that a little bit if that was sort of like intentional yeah I mean I'm, I'm careful to I don't want to suggest um, to anyone that I believe if anybody is sexually abused that then they become like a perpetrator I mean I certainly don't believe that um, but um, to go back to the politics that I spoke about at the top of this, I wanted it to be this like, it was, it was almost like a, um, this cyclical uh, pattern of abuse and power and, and, and a way to continue to maintain power in a really perverse way that um, it was almost like in order to continue the cycle, I needed to get you when you were young and you were still impressionable and you were still um, learning about the world and yourselves. And I needed to, not me, but they needed to capture you in that moment in order to continue the cycle. And our character, Alex, you know, he, he ran away as a, as a teenager at some point to try and escape this abuse. He's an eccentric drifter. He has arrested development issues. He's using imperfect and kind of arcane and strange tools to try and find peace. And um, his ego is very fragile and his defenses are very fragile. And when he comes back into this world, thinking that it's going to be another step forward where he's making amends and finding closure with his mother, um, his, his strength in all of those regards gets tested immediately as he gets thrust back into this world and his resolve to go back into that world and be a defender of um, better values that will, that will stop this cycle also get tested. And the viewer is, is, is meant to be thrust into his psyche in terms of that place of confusion and almost surrealism where he's trying to, trying to really desperately understand what is healing, what is harmful, what is good, what is bad, um, what's moving me forward, what's keeping me here. And 
I wanted the audience not to be confused, but I wanted them to be in that same space of not fully, you know, at some points, not fully trusting their protagonist and also not fully knowing if he was going to make the right choice. And, um, yeah. You know, it, it, what I find interesting about what you've just said is you know, thinking about violence and the generational nature of violence and the way that violence when introduced um, in your life as an early, you know, at an early age, has such a powerful imprint. Um, you know, there's a, in, in Strong Island, my mother's, um, my grandfather, um, you know, my parents grew up in the Jim Crow South, and my grandfather went to the hospital um, when he was having an asthma attack, he was made to wait in the colored waiting room and he essentially suffocated um, and died when my mother was two years old. Um, and that kind of that kind of very personal violence, combined with the very uh, real, um, you know, uh, racist, um, you know, campaign of terror that was waged against Black people in the South, which you know was the reason why millions of Black people fled the South. Um, you know, the imprint of that violence travels with you, right? And so I think that for my parents. Um, they they moved from the south to the city, and still in um, I think in the back, especially of my father's mind, um, they were still outrunning a certain type of violence that they knew was um, behind them. You know, like when you're running and you don't want to look back because you don't want to accidentally slow down. Um, I I feel like that was my father's motivation for insisting on the move to the suburbs, right? But the violence followed them anyway. And I think that that's so uniquely, um, that's so uniquely American, um, spe you know, especially when it's racialized violence, that you think that you've gotten to a place of safety. You think you've gotten to a place where um, it, you, know, you might not be able to sort things out for yourself, um, or you might not be able to go back and make things right for your for your parents, and they still live in the Jim Crow South, but you have somehow gotten your children to a place where um, the kind of ever-present threat of physical violence won't be a part of their lives um, by achieving this middle-class status, by you know, sort of buying into and supporting all of these structures that everyone tells black people that if you do this, you do that, you do the other thing, then you will be okay. Um, and you know, for for my for my parents, the very real lesson of violence in America is that you can do you know you can follow all of the rules, you can play by you know a, um, the the quote unquote book, but violence will still seek you out. You know, violence will still come and find you um, if you are um, you know in communities. Um, that the majority of society has always responded to with violence. So whether it's violence against you know the queer community, whether it's violence against gay men, um, or you know um, trans people, um, or violence against you know blacks in the South and um, and those people who were trying to you know participate in the civil rights movement, you know that 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 violence is something that they that they couldn't shake, and it ultimately. Um, cost them their their son and cost them their own lives, right? So it's not just that there was an act of violence perpetrated upon one of their children by a, a white man who wasn't punished for his crime, but he, that white man didn't, in the minds of our criminal justice system, even commit a crime, you know? So that black, you know, I, I think about that black box in the, you know, in the apps that you, you know, were looking at, and it's like, yes, that's exactly right. You know, that perpetrator, that, you know, Mark Riley is for me that black box. I know his name, but I don't know anything else about him. Um, so when in the film I say he looks like every white man I've ever seen, it is, you know, it's, it's the, it's the ever-present danger, right, of violence that confronts us all, whether it's, you know, based on, on, on our, our queer identity or, or based on our race. It, it is that that black spot that is f floating everywhere, yeah. you know. And I, can I jump in? Of course. Yeah. I was, I'm interested in talking to you about um, the particular moment we're in in America right now. 
and um, a word that's kind of become buzzword, I guess, um, in terms of uniting uh, progressive people against this authoritarian regime that is in the White House right now. The buzzword around intersexual in intersectionalism or intersectionality. yeah, intersectionality. And I find so much hope in that. And I feel like in particularly so many white people have stood on the sidelines or men or white men um, stood on the sidelines um, around issues of uh, people of color and around issues around women's rights being attacked. And I feel like there's a moment now that, that seems hopeful, in my eyes anyway, seems hopeful in that it seems like um, especially the white people are, are, are coming together with like Black Lives Matter and, and, and the LGBTQ community. And, like, uh, like all of the communities seem to be having a moment of recognition of like we need to fucking get together right now and we need to realize that any differences or any sort of like passivity that we had around like – I mean it goes – in some ways it goes back to that famous – I turn to you as the German here. At that famous, sorry, Toby. Hitler, Hitler or what? At first they came. Exactly. At first they came for whoever, and I didn't say anything. At first they came for them, and I didn't say anything, and then they came for me. And I feel like um, in America right now, there's a sense of we all, all of us who believe in civil rights and human rights and the dignity of each other, are are coming together in a way that that has me very hopeful, you know. Um, but I'm curious, as a black trans person, like, how are you experiencing this? And um, are you finding the same kind of hope in, in, the, in the ways that I'm discussing? Um, I'm, I'm experiencing it in two, I'm experiencing it in two ways. Um, the first, you know, to be, to, be, <laughs> to be perfectly honest with you, um, is that you know, wh when I when I woke up the morning after, I mean, no, I actually went to sleep, and it was so fucked up because we finished our our sound mix, yeah. um, and you know we had we had scotch and and we we raised the glass and we were all so happy, and like Hillary's gonna win. Well, it, you know, we just we well we were in the we were in the studio all day long, right? And we voted and and you know sort of went off to our respective, um, you know, homes or wh whatever parties we were going to be at to watch the, the election returns. And when it became obvious about 45 minutes after we had gotten to our destination um, that Donald Trump and all of the polls were wrong, I was, you know, I was sort of like, yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. And then when my friends started to express surprise and shock and outrage and how could this be? Uh, you know, like, where did all these white supremacists come from? Where did all these racist white people come from? I was sort of like, where are, like, what planet have you been living on? <laughs> you know, like, where have you been? You know, like, I have to, you know, my, my partner is white, she happens to be Jewish. We have to use her race as a tool to navigate American society, and we always have. We've, we've done so for the past 21 years. And so one of the things that I experienced was this kind of, you know, welcome to my world, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. kind of like, and, and not, in a, not, in a, not in a hostile way, but in a sort of like, finally, everybody's awake yeah, yeah, yeah. moment. And, and, you know, going forward, as, as, you know, these different communities figure out how to coalesce, Right, because that's the thing that, that resistance you know, communities in the states have never quite been able to do. We've never quite been able to agree on who gets to be in charge, right? And so I think that we're also at a moment of um, everyone being like, shit, I have something at stake right now, but I don't know um, if we're quite at the moment of knowing how to move forward together. And that's the thing that, that I'm afraid of. Not that you know, the white folks who have been insulated by harmful policies f from presidents going back to Nixon, right? Because Nixon was, is where the law and order, or return to law and order comes from, right? Um, I'm really glad that those folks um, are sort of awake now and, and realize that they have something at stake. But what I don't know is how we are going to move together as a single movement that is needed to fight back against a person who is trying to 
essentially turn America into a fascist state. And that's what I, and that's what I honestly believe about Donald Trump. I, I think the same thing about him. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, I would like to go back to something um, that you said before, which is sort of like uh, corresponds with what you just said about Trump. But there was there was an SNL skit. I don't know if you've seen it exactly about that, about the white uh, reaction to that. And I kind of like felt like I'm not even U.S. American, but it is kind of like, well, that's offensive. So like, all the white and the black friends go together to celebrate what's happening, and then they always have this time lapse, and it gets more and more clear that um, uh, it might not be Hillary actually. And then you know they drink more, and then eat Xanax, and Vanessa Bay is just like off, and it's like no, this can't be. America is actually racist. <laughs> and then in the back, it's just like two Ooh. black guys, and they're like. Oh, well, they finally figured it out. Just like, and they're like, I'm hyperventilating. The uh, world is ending. And exactly what you said, of course, Trump will. But do you, do you, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but yeah. like the, um, do, to do you, you know, like, because there's the, cause the question of it being a referendum on Obama. And, li and like, of course, like, the racism with Obama being in there was just so blatant. Right. And, like, from the beginning of, like, we're not going to let this president do anything and right. obstruct, obstruct, obstruct. Right. But the whole misogyny piece with Hillary is something that also is just like, I don't know how you, 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 you quantify that in the whole mix because it's all, it's all in the soup. I mean. Yeah, it, it is all, it's all in the soup. And, and you know, the, the misogynistic attacks that Hillary Clinton had to withstand and that ultimately um, were, I think, um, among the most effective things that, um, you know, destroyed her campaign, including the Russian government. Um, uh, y you know, it, it was the fact that she was attacked for being a woman, and that, I and and also the way that that Hillary Clinton has always been um, attacked. There, there's always been this subtle homophobic attack um, on Hillary Clinton, and there's always been this whisper. There's always been a whisper campaign about Hillary Clinton being a closeted lesbian, you know, who was having affairs with X Y Z A B C, and so, you know, she was othered in so many ways by, by, by mainstream uh, media who didn't say a thing or didn't call, you know, um, who didn't call things as they were, um, but also by politicians who were perfectly fine um, using all of this, um, you know, homophobic, transphobic, um, you know, misogynistic, and m m you know, violent language against her, lit literal, literal violence language against her to help undo her campaign. Um, all of that is the same, all of that springs from the same source in my book. All of it springs from the same source, um, which is a fear of um, s heterosexual, white, um, you know, straight, cisgendered identity not being at the top of the pyramid and able to dictate how everyone else lives. And they're willing to destroy the world in, an, in, in, a, in, a, in a final show of brute masculine. Fo I mean, I think yes. that. Yes, yes. I mean, I think that's, where, that's what's so scary right now is I feel like they're willing to do that. Like, they would rather destroy the world as a show of brute masculine force than to acquiesce or to compromise or to concede anything to other people. Concession is the last it, concession as a as a concept is so anti-masculine, yeah. right? Concession as a concept and compromise as a concept is so gay, right? That that so it's so feminine. It's so effeminate. It's so like it's weak. It's weak. They think it's, it's weak. Exactly. It's submissive. It's weak. It's not. Ha it's not how men are supposed to behave, right? It's not how straight men are supposed to behave. So any any sort of um, you know any sort of leadership style or, 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 or you know, collective, um, you know, organizing that involves any of that is inherently queer in the broadest sense um, uh, you know, that the word queer can be applied. Yeah. Um, and that's why it's so dangerous and that's why people who haven't voted in, you know, decades turned out to vote for Donald Trump because he is the strong man who will stand up and say, you know, like these, you know, like trans kids do not get to go to the bathroom that <laughs> corresponds to their identity, and I'm going to undo all the LGBT protections and, um, you know, in the, you know, Obama administration, and I'm going to stand up and, you know, like make deals, like, 
governance is deal making somehow and transactional somehow and if you do not have the power to participate in these transactions or if you are somehow boxed out of the transactional governance that um, he and his businessmen want to establish then you are just essentially you know you're fucked yeah. and, and that's exactly what they want Um, we um, we're chatting away greatly, and I realize that we should open it up to the audience. I just wanted one, one little point um, to go back to. Um, you, you talked about this place of safety mm -hmm. about your parents, and this this idea that there is no place of safety. That um, you m you know that even if you go to a place like like Long Island, there um, there is sort of like uh, the knowledge about this not being safe or something. Uh, happening and I thought that this is actually, and I wonder if, if that's also what you mean, um, sort of like an analogy about what happened with Trump, that there was this idea that if you have lived in oppression or fear, um, the shock wasn't really there, the non-shock that you had, that there was a wide shock in a way maybe because there was a promise of safety, there was maybe a narrative of, of safety that despite everything, the racial violence that happened, despite like this eruption of racialized shootings and the fact that Black Lives Matter evolved under Obama, there's still a wide narrative of the charm and the beauty and the niceness and all the good things, I mean, that did, and Obamacare and all these things that, that white people are not directly concerned with. Would you, mm -hmm. would you sort of agree to that? I mean, the charm, that was of course a little bit, you know, over the top, but you know what I mean? Like, you know, the love for Obama, sure. I mean, is in a way also like drastically unpolitical if you <laughs> sort of like, you know, the glorification of him, I think, yeah. Um, because other things don't concern me. I can cry over Black Lives Matter, but you know, I'm a white person. I don't know that fear. You know what I mean? Like, would you say that this idea of your parents' history of the place of safety that is never there um, can be transported to the shock or non-shock of Trump becoming? I, I don't. I don't think that my parents' notion of, of the safety that's never secure can be applied in the same way or understood um, or used as a means of understanding how. Um, many white people have come to see the danger posed by Donald Trump because my father, uh, my family, and many other um, you know, communities of color live in such deep segregation still to this day that they are surrounded by this danger. Um, Trayvon Martin was walking home from a 7-Eleven in a gated community in Sanford, Florida. He was not, you know, like, these kids always get away with this kind of stuff. You know, George Zimmerman on the phone with the cops. And they, they were in a gated community. You know, you, you need a key to get into a gated community, right? So, so black people have always lived with white people who don't necessarily want them around, right? Which is why my, which is why still to this day, Long Island is one of the most segregated places in, in the country. Um, white Americans are able to live in communities of like-minded white Americans and therefore have a blind spot for you know this this ever-present ever-growing intergenerational white supremacy um, that has not um, gone away it's actually on it's actually gotten worse the the county where I live or where I grew up, went for Donald Trump by, you know, by almost 80 points. The place where I grew up, where this murder took place, went for Donald Trump in overwhelming numbers. Just to, to echo that, like, I grew up in rural Ohio, and, you know, there was no shortage of racism and homophobia and misogyny in, in the country in Ohio, but I would have never... Um, it was never so outspoken or, or so um, galvanized. And my mom told me that two weeks before the election, the same house I grew up in, and there's like a cow farm on one side and a woods on the other, so it's like country, country. Two houses over, they put up a Confederate flag, which is something that would have never happened as a kid. In the 80s and the early 90s, that would have never happened. And now it's like, okay. And... You know, like, 
I certainly don't want to put rural white people off the hook because I'm furious at that. I ended my relationship with my father because he was like a Trump supporter and we got into a place where I was just like, I can no longer respect you. I, can, I, I don't know how to reconcile this. But most of these people, they don't have, they don't, for, for reasons that are their own responsibility and also just the, where they live, they have such little exposure to people unlike them and then they, they swallow by like the handful Fox News and this conservative radio that's, that's in my film. And they hear these very powerful narratives by these voices that are so strong and with conviction that um, they believe them, you know? And they're fed all of these lies. And then also we're a country that for reasons I think to, to keep all of this going it, primarily, we put so much of our our, our federal budget into defense. And we have like such a small amount of our, our federal budget that goes into education. I mean like for all of this to continue, we need to keep people stupid or ignorant or confused. Or, or in fear. Or, so. or in fear or, or in tanks and, and Humvees yeah. on the sides of roads all over the world being blown up occupying places where we do not need to be, trying to impose democracy or our idea of what it means to be a democratic society on places that we have invaded for over like 30 years of war. I mean, it, it, it's, it's how, I mean, how many poor white soldiers are there in the army? Yeah. You know, like we are like, so, so folks who might otherwise not vote for Trump are voting for Trump because they're being they're fodder. They're fodder for the American military machine, as are you know many you know um, young people of color for whom the you know the the stipend that you get if you make it out alive yeah. um, of the army is is the biggest motivation for going in. Yeah, there's that whole long history I think that goes back at least to the Civil War of trying to separate like poor white people yep. that weren't necessarily like directly engaged in slavery and then black people in terms of like keeping them separate so they could not be joined together as a, as a force based around their economics and their situation. Right. And it continues to this day. Exactly. But the, the, the shocking thing I think is like I just listened to parts of the, the speech that Trump gave like with Justin Trudeau being in the White House and once again like it's a narrative of fear that I find almost comical when I watch it that he talks about the great alliance of Canada and the US in the defense and I was like in the defense of what you know that being taken and taken to Germany and so many other countries where the construction of a menace, like, you know, a picture book construction of a menace, the idea of the alternative facts, of the lying, of the, the post-factual is, is applies it to, to, to the Muslim threat in Germany so well. And what you said, the people who are never exposed to the so-called other, the people in a state in Germany where 5% are non-white, like immigrants, where there are literally no Muslims, people who've never seen a headscarf, they go out and protest in a way that is so aggressive against the Islamization of you know, the West, and they have nothing to do with it. And the same thing that happened a little later in America happened here, that the press was excluded from it. And the Americans are using the German word Lügenpresse, lying press. It's taken from the right-wing movement in Germany because they would not give interviews anymore and would stop the talk with the press and see them as an enemy until one station, sorry to go into this, but it's okay. so, you know, um, that one station they had like a montage about the people protesting and then they said you're lying and then they responded by publishing the entire unedited material about these people who's like it's the grandmother who's afraid she will ha have to uh, celebrate Christmas in a mosque because you know and it was even more shocking to have that but like to see how many uh, things go on parallelly you know you can even transport it to so many other countries France you know to uh, Turkey, hello, I mean, in, in, in England. Yeah. Denmark, I, I was in Denmark at, you know, during the rise of the Denmark People's Party. I was cutting my film there, you know, when Brexit was happening, I was cutting my film there when, um, you know, Denmark went from a place where people were just trying to transit through to Malmo. And when um, the Danish government started fining ordinary Danes for simply, you know, essentially picking up hitchhikers and driving them across the bridge. 
you know, when you when you went from being able to get on the train at, at Copenhagen Central Station, and, you know, and buy a ticket and go to Malmo to having, you know, and to being stopped and having your credentials scanned and photographed on on mobile phones by the poli by the police before you could even, you know, pass from the bottom of the staircase onto the platform to get onto the train. It, it the 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 speed at which I watched the kind of right wing nationalism that elected Donald Trump spread um, in Europe during the year that I was cutting my film in Copenhagen was terrifying. When I woke up the next morning after Brexit and heard people in the Netherlands started talking about Nexit and all of these other countries started talking starting to talk about leaving. There's the France election coming up. There's the German election coming exactly. up. I mean, all of these things. Yeah, I mean, in a couple of interviews I did, I, w I was I was explaining like mm -hmm. this is I ma I made a very very American film that is maybe a little bit more European in the style and construction of it, but it's a story that could be any of these anyway, places that that's you're right. talking about in terms of uh, the politics. And what strikes me about your film, and especially that, that scene where um, the two men are watching, um, where the two men are watching uh, the porn together, I it's. It strikes me that the loneliness of each of those men in that scene and in that moment that they are you know that they are that they're watching th instead of in, instead of having an intimate moment with one another you know they're jacking off to porn and, and straight porn and straight and straight porn right and so the 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 loneliness in each of those men for me in that scene is just a profound how they could sit there and not not look at each other um, clearly, you know, there's desire there, but it, it also, you know, I, I, I somehow think that that line of loneliness has something to do with, with what happened in the United States and the alienation of, 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 of white men from one another. Um, for fear of being perceived as queer, for fear of being perceived as soft, um, has resulted in hyper masculinity that is so aggressive that if somebody embarrasses you for not fixing their girlfriend's car, they will shoot and kill you because people were laughing at you and calling you a girl, yeah. which is what happened in my brother's case. I, I definitely see that. I agree with that. I think I always think I always think to my dad mm. because I feel like he's like. Again, like we're no longer talking to each other, but I feel like he is the the example of this sort of like late sixties white straight conservative man who lives in the country. He lives in the country by himself, mm. like on a, a driveway that's like a mile into the woods, and um, he feels so disenfranchised. Mm. So it's like, what's the other? I'm terrible with like actual quotes and people's names and stuff. But what's the other quote where it's like? Um, when you're used to privilege, equality feels like oppression. Huh. Something like that. Mm. Do you know? Mm -hmm. People have heard this. And so I think that for someone like my dad, who, who came of age in the 60s, and he was an, a white athlete in the country, and like all mm. the girls wanted him, and you know all that kind of stuff, like there were certain things that he was born into that were just told implicitly and explicitly of like, you will be awarded this, you will be given this, you deserve this, this is your place in the world. And now as an older man, he's seen people say, well, I deserve a piece of that too. And he doesn't see it as people wanting equality. He sees it as people taking things from him. Mm. And so he feels really um, depleted. Mm. Like that mm. um, his identity that he's built his life on has been sort of, um, it's in tatters because it's in his mind Everybody wants to take a piece of it for themselves, and so he's going to be left with what? Right. How will he understand himself in this world? Right, and the myth and the myth of a limited pie. Exactly, and, and, exactly. And, and, and the the ever so, sort of the probably one of the most brilliant political ruses, you know, in the history of American politics is this myth of the limited pie. Yeah. Right. So you have to defend your slice um, at all costs, while you know the oligarchs. And our politicians essentially are, are eating the rest of it. I want to give sorry we're, we're we're chatting away. Yeah, um, uh, Liz, there is a microphone over there. That's filmmaker and activist Liz Rosenfeld. Hi, thank you both so much. I unfortunately have not had a chance to see your films. Um, I am a U.S. 
Jewish filmmaker who actually, um, I've been here for almost nine years. I returned um, very much against the uh, wishes of my family and re actually before I came, I would even say back to Germany, I, um, I received dual citizenship because my grandparents um, lived here and escaped under the Third Reich. They didn't even both know each other during that time. They met later in their lives. Um, and my, my UPO is part of the resistance actually in Munich. Um, and so I have, and I actually came here to really understand that history. And when I first came here, my whole family was also having lived in the same household as my grandparents growing up were super, you know, they felt that I was turning my back actually on them as American Jews who, um, particularly my dad who came from working class Long Island, um, where when suddenly all of these KKK flyers started showing up about six months ago is in complete and utter shock um, that in the place that he has basically spent his entire life, um, and also he um, is a you know, civil rights lawyer, all of these things, like really democracy, the thing that he believed the most in has just slapped him in the face. Um, and so I'm very curious because I make films here and I feel like um, I was here for Obama's first and second term. So I was watching everything from outside and also watching everything with a sense of a globalized world that I feel I would have never received if I had actually stayed in the States, um, which was a big part of my own kind of repolitization politicization as a person as well. But I'm curious for you two who are making very political work that's extremely relevant. I mean, not that it wasn't when you decided to make these works, but has now taken on a new kind of relevance in a sense, or maybe not new, but you know, it's heightened, right? What is, I'm just curious, um, I know you're talking about your experiences living in the States, but as filmmakers, as artists, if you identify that way, as creative people, I'm curious what your feeling is right now in terms of, um, I don't know, where work like this is headed in the United States right now. Do you feel embraced? Do you feel afraid of maybe um, releasing this work? Where, I don't know, I just would like to know what it's like for you as filmmakers. Yeah, I, I think very, <coughs> for me, um, I, I'm not afraid to release the film. Um, I have um, learned how to live with the kind of fear um, that my parents lived with, um, and I have learned where to put it um, and how to function um, and to find courage to act in spite of it. Um, how this film will be received in the States um, you know, remains to be seen because the, the Berlin Alley is is only our second festival. It's the international premiere of the film, <coughs> and the f the film is yet to play in New York, where the story is situated. Um, but as a rule, I have to be honest with you. I've never taken for granted that I was ever going to live in a world without fear. <coughs> so um, I. I So that's just, I mean, that's just how I've lived my life. I, I just, it, I, it was never something that I had. It was something that went away that when I, when I was 19, right? And that was 25 years ago. So a world without fear is not something that I expect. In fact, I, I expect a world, um, you know, in the United States to, um, to try to magnify, magnify fear, the, the exact type of fear that was used to justi justify my brother's murder. Um, and I recognize that fear for what it is. I'm prepared to, you know, to battle and to push back against that fear as I need to. Um, but it, it's not ever something I expected to live without. Long Island actually happens to be one of the, um, one of the sort of have it has one of the highest concentrations of neo-Nazi, Klan, neo-Klan, alt-right. Absolutely. The, the Southern Poverty Law Center has tracked hate groups across the United States for years. And one of the highest concentrations of hate groups in the United States has always been on Long Island. Yeah. <coughs> always.
Yeah. Yeah. I think that those communities that it hasn't been obvious to you, yeah. those are the communities that are going to have to figure out how to live in a world where fear is a driving political factor and be able to act anyway. And I, uh, to take a couple quick, quick things, I, th I think in terms of the fear you were saying getting worse and just uh, uh, rising even more, I mean, I think for a president who is so narcissistic, insecure, and obsessed with ratings and popularity, the only way that that's going to change, which, I mean, everybody across the board can kind of, whether you're Republican or Democrat or progressive or otherwise, feels that this three-week rollout has been a disaster. And I think the only way for that to change for him and his regime is to either somehow through his channels have a terrorist attack again on American soil so everybody gets around the strong man or yeah yeah and either that or um, you know conflict in South China Sea North Korea Iran you know like you take your pick um, but in terms of making uh, art being a filmmaker at this time I'm excited because I feel like um, an urgency around it I'm not scared, and I feel like I personally can't imagine making work now and in the foreseeable future that doesn't have politics in the DNA of it. It doesn't mean that I'm going to make a Michael Moore documentary and, and like pontificate in that kind of way, but, but I can't imagine making work that doesn't feel like it has some sort of social relevance, and that to me feels exciting because it makes me feel like the work I'm doing um, will have some sort of potential importance to it. Um, but I'm also glad you brought that up because one thing I wanted to say, especially since we're on video and people can watch this elsewhere, and yeah. obviously all of you wonderful people here, um, you know, we're lucky enough to be filmmakers and to have a voice where we can talk about these things. That's right. Not everybody can be a filmmaker, but this is not the time for people to be quiet. Right. It is not the time for people to isolate. This is the time for people to do some thinking about what skills they have and to be vocal and to engage in whatever those skills are. And, and it's time for people to, I think, really embrace technology and the inexpensive ways in which technology can be used to break down the isolation that people who, f who rule by fear count on, right? I, got, I came home for, for a break um, for, for the month of January, and when we turned on the television, I thought we were looking for the Wimbledon women's final, and what I found instead on TV was the Facebook streaming of Philando Castile lying in a car having been shot in the arm by a police officer, and I watched him die on TV. And that was Facebook Live. We all have in our pockets the ability to take whatever is happening in our communities and turn it into media, right? Because citizens are the ones who, we're not sitting in a room with Sean Spicer talking in circles and acting like he's, you know, the most brilliant Thank person. God. Thank God. I would, you know, in, uh, you know, on the planet. We are out in our communities and we have the capability. We have the capability. We simply have to think differently now. Right, our, our cell phone cameras and Twitter and, and, and Facebook are not just toys for the young. They're not just for millennials. They are for, 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 for counter-narrative generation. They are for keeping people grounded in what is real as opposed to keeping people in fear of, the f of, of you know, this, this coming disaster. That, that Trump is so, so counting on to keep everyone silent and afraid. We have to use the tools that we have to break that. And, and we all have them. Uh, I'll try to, my name is Maverick. Uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing your views with us and your works. Uh, I haven't seen them. I'll try to be succinct. I, I want to throw um, an idea into the round here now, which, which I'm burning to find out because uh, I've been living and working in Germany since 1984. I come from Singapore. I love it here. That's why. Uh, and uh, what I would like to know from the Americans, because the both of you have the same views. I think that most of us share the same views about Trump. But what I'm curious about 
is I'm sure there are LGBT people who wanted change, just like there were women. Even uh, nevertheless, that the tr there was all this misoge uh, miso misogyny, it, mis yeah, uh, things. There were women who would vote for Trump. Now, how about the LGBT people who vote for Trump, who has differing views from you? I'd like to know what makes them tick. What why made them vote for him? Is it is that all there is to it? I, I, yeah. I don't think you can. I, I mean, I, I think it's difficult and maybe not possible for us to be like. I mean, I do think that that is a piece of it for a lot of people, but um, I think it varies. You know, um, I think if you're if you're a gay person and you hate that you're a gay person and everyone around you is like this country white person who who emphasizes a certain type of lifestyle and masculinity, then you know, you're gonna have certain uh, ways of thinking that are gonna be different. Um, I, th I, I think it, I don't know, what do you think? I feel, I feel like it varies with so many people yeah. and I don't feel like we're, any of us are like a monolith. Right. You know what I mean? I'm, right. not all, I'm not just a white man, I'm not just a gay man, I'm not just, you know, like, sure. and, and I think that sometimes those other pieces weigh more heavily in different moments of your identity than, than other ones. I think that before I even attempt to answer that question, what I think about is change from what, right? Change from eight years of an African-American president who for all of his faults, and he has many, right? Um, he started the My Brother's Keeper initiative. He enacted the Affordable Care Act. He, you know, he talked about too far too late in his presidency for, for my taste, but he did begin to talk about criminal justice reform. He talked about race more than any president, um, you know, um, period, who's ever been elected um, in the United States. So, so my question first is, fine, you want change, but what do you want change from? What is it that you want to change from? And why is it that and, and what is it about that that was such a threat to you? If you're so desperate for that change, I need you to articulate to me because I'm actually interested in it. What was so threatening about it to you? What happened to you over the eight years of the Obama presidency that needed to change so drastically that you would elect a narcissist, someone with a, 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 with a diagnosable personality disorder to run the most powerful, dangerous country on the planet. What happened over the last uh, eight I years? Yeah. I'm sorry, but I feel uh. misunderstood here. That's not my question. My yes. question was, your views yes. uh, against Trump are almost similar, but I'm interested in the views of the LGBT people no, who I've voted for him. That's exactly what I'm asking. I'm, I'm, I'm asking, they voted for change. What you're saying is that those people, the 45% the or so of women who voted for Donald Trump, right? Not and just women, the and not LGBT just women, the LGB well. LGBT community yes. voted for Trump because they wanted change. I'm right? not sure if they want to change. I, I, I want to know I what's the reason why well they I did it. Well, that's why I'm asking the question back to you. I don't know what the reason was. It's not, I it's not just change I'm asking I about. Why did they do it? I, I, I do know of some like somewhat high-profile gay men who voted for Trump and were vocal about voting for Trump, not because they believe in him or his policies, but they believe that with Hillary, it would be more of the same and that we needed something so disruptive that was going to blow up the system in a way where we would have to start anew. I mean, it's a little bit of a privileged utopia to, to have that position. And of course, these are all white gay men I'm talking about. But, um, but there is that arm of people in the LGBT com community that I think voted for him or supported him, not because they like him, but because they thought a bomb needed to explode in order for us to start afresh. And if that bomb didn't happen, it would be more of the same with half measures and band-aids. But then of course there are the people who voted for him because of his policies, you know? So it's not, again, it's not like we're monoliths. There's a lot of racism in the gay community, you know? I know. I'm <laughs> I come from Singapore. I've been living here since 84, I know and misogyny and so on and so forth and yeah 
and very outspoken right-wing radicals. I uh, refuse to remember that name of that Greek American. Uh. Yeah, exactly. Okay, let's not go there. Um, we're we're already. Like is there? Okay, can we have this as the last question? Is that possible? Because we're already. Or if there are more other pressing questions, I have to open up the restaurant. Then maybe we can like take it outside or like. But please, last question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've been really um, impressed with the films here at the Berlinale and at Sundance, and I feel like there's this sense of hope that's coming out of the content that's been created in the past year. Thank goodness. Um, I was at a panel discussion with the filmmaker Gurinder Chada, who talked about how she's driven as a filmmaker by this, um, this need to expand the understanding of what it means to be British. She's, born, she's an Indian woman born in Kenya, raised in the UK. And I feel like a common thread coming through a lot of the films that we're seeing here is this sort of need to expand the sense of what it is um, to be human um, so I wanted to thank you both for your films and um, I'm interested in hearing you talk a little bit about um, something that both your films or both your um, inspirations I suppose have in common which is the notion of silence within families and um, the, the ways that we don't communicate with our families and I wonder if your films have helped you come to terms with that at all. Um, I mean, very, very simply for me, um, making Strong Island was the first time that my mother and I and my sister and I spoke with one another about what happened to my brother. Um, we had literally um, lived for, you know, the decades um, since his passing without being explicit with each other about how it affected us and how we felt. Um, And so with that blast of air, I will, I will pass the mic sound, to Travis. The sound design. Yes, the sound, the sound design. It was literally the first time we talked about um, what happened with each other, and I'm glad for it. Yeah, I think, I mean, like, I made a movie called Discreet, and there's different ways in which I hope people can question the use of that word in the film, because I feel like behind that there is is uh, secrecy mm -hmm. and, and silence. And um, there's different types of discretion that are harmless, but the, the types of discretion that I talk about in this film are ones that are harmful and the longer they go on have the potential to create generations of harm, cycles of abuse, cycles of violence. And I think, um, I mean, I think just as humans, even if we're talking about like how you care about somebody, like it's important to say like at different points, like, I love you, like I appreciate you, you know, like just the more that we don't share who we really are, I think the, the more traps we potentially can get in that are big and small um, that can cause harm. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for this wonderful discussion and very lengthy and personal discussion and not discreet, but indiscreetly uh, intimate and frank uh, discussion. Yancy Ford and Travis Matthews, thank you so much. Both their films, Strong Island and Discreet, can be seen here. Thank you very, very, very much.